When I was in uh, high school and college, I struggled for a long time trying to figure out sort of what did I want to be when I grew up because everything interested me. And I, I absolutely had the idea. There's a wonderful um, short story by Robert Heinlein called They Also Walk Dogs in which, uh, or excuse me, we also walk dogs. That's the motto of a business. That it's, that we also walk dogs. And um, they basically do thinking for people. They will consult on anything. And I thought, gee, that's what I'd really like to do. I'd like to be a person who hangs out a sign that says, we also walk dogs. And people would come to me, and anything they needed help with, I would figure out how to solve their problem, whatever it was. Well, as I got to be older, I realized that that, of course, wasn't practical. You can't say to people, I'll solve any problem of any kind you have, whether it's a mathematical theorem or a problem in nuclear physics or a problem of wiring your house or whatever. You have to be a specialist. Um, my uh, girlfriend in uh, college said, uh, have you thought about law school? I went to law school. I'm one of these sick people who loved law school. When I came out, I didn't know what kind of lawyer I wanted to be, but I wanted to be a lawyer because I got to play with the law. This incredible, and I don't mean in any way to belittle it, but this incredible game, this huge puzzle. I ended up in the tax law field because tax has nothing to do with tax returns or very little to do with tax returns and all that. Again, among fields of law, it is probably the hardest of the intellectual games. And then to my delight, I discovered that it was also very human, that it involved helping people solve problems. I really like being a lawyer. Um, if I didn't have to uh, pay my mortgage and things like that, I probably would hang it up at this point and become a writer full time. But uh, unfortunately, being a writer doesn't pay well enough in general to uh, allow me to live the way that my family and I have lived and choose to live. So I'd always been a, a wannabe writer. I, I'd tried a few short stories here and there, and I'd always loved telling stories. But what pushed me over the line was my wife. Um, my wife, Sharon, who in the mid-90s, I think once too often, I said to her, well, what are we doing this weekend? Because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm that kind of person. I'm sort of very anal. I like to have activities and agendas and things like that. Um, and she said, uh, why don't you write something? You have all those books upstairs. So I thought about it, and I thought, you know, I've been writing legal articles and memos and the like for years and years. What if I tried my hand at writing things about, in this case, it started with Sherlock Holmes. Um, and I need to explain that there has been a tradition for over 100 years of amateur scholarship about Sherlock Holmes, published amateur scholarship, uh, books, journals. And I started out writing some essays. And um, after I had a certain number under my belt, I got the wild idea that I would be the person to update uh, a magnificent book called The Annotated Sherlock Holmes. Um, that book is really what hooked me on Sherlock Holmes in the first place. It was published in 1967. It's by a man named William Baring Gould. Um, and for a generation of Sherlockians, it was the standard reference book. Um, I got hooked on Sherlock Holmes when I got my copy of that book in the 60s. And I love the whole idea of the study of the Sherlock Holmes stories and the study of the age. And I fantasized that I might be someday the one to update it. So I started. I just sort of said to myself, well, why not try it? So I started re-annotating some stories, using Bering Gould very much as a template. Some people saw it and said, gee, this is really good. Let's publish it. Uh, it was published originally as a series called the Sherlock Holmes Reference Library. This was aimed at what I would call the Sherlockian market. These are the hardcore fans and scholars. Those books were hugely successful in that market. That means I sold 500 copies over a period of uh, five to 10 years. In um, 2002, I got the call that changed my life. Um, the senior editor of W.W. Uh, w. Norton knew the Baron Gould book and really wanted to put out a new edition of it. It had come out in 1967. It was now out of print. It had been a big success in the publishing community. Um, and I know now that he first called my friend Michael Durda. Michael is uh, the former book editor of the Washington Post, Pulitzer Prize winning critic, um, and a well-known 
fan of the Sherlock Holmes stories, and Bob asked Michael um, if he would edit this book for them. And bless Michael, he said, no thanks, but there's this guy already doing it that you should contact. So they called me up out of the blue and said, um, would you edit this set of books for us? And uh, when I picked myself up off the floor, uh, I said, me, of course. Uh, it was my lifelong dream. And uh, so I wrote the set that became the set called The New Annotated Sherlock Holmes. I had thought in the beginning it was going to be a piece of cake. I would just take the books I'd already written uh, and just make a few minor changes and I'd be done. In fact, Norton wanted me to completely rewrite those footnotes to be much more user-friendly, much less in the style of law review, uh, and include pictures, include a lot more Victorian cultural material and so on. So it turned out to be a big project. It took about two and a half years to turn the books that already existed into uh, the books that were published for Norton. It, it actually isn't as hard as it sounds. I mean, people often accuse me of being a vampire, and not, not sleeping, things like that. Um, I, I do have an active uh, mind, but I found that doing annotations was a, it really suited perfectly this, the time I had available because I could come home at night, have dinner with my wife, you know, maybe even watch television for an hour or something, um, and then go upstairs and work for an hour or two on one footnote or most of one footnote and I'd finish it the next night because really what the annotations are are hundreds and hundreds of mini essays on little subjects. You read the text slowly for one thing. You've got to really slow down and put yourself in the, in, into the mindset of maybe an alien being um, you know, who, who has never heard the English language before. <laughs> Um, I, I said, for example, uh, that someday someone will do the annotated uh, Jacqueline Suzanne Valley of the Dolls or something, explaining things like, what's a wristwatch? Uh, and what's a princess telephone? And uh, even, I mean, look around today. I mean, someday people will need to explain what's an iPod and, you know, how did all that stuff work? And uh, so there are assumptions that the writer made in writing any book. And when you're annotating, you want to step back and try and understand what those assumptions were and explain them. Um, some of them are just glossary, you know, explaining words that may have gone out of context um, or, or out of usage. Um, some of them are cultural history. Now, with the Victorian age, um, it's, it's pretty straightforward because clearly very few people remember Victorian times. Uh, the project I'm working on now is a mixture of classical literature and contemporary history. Um, and so in some ways, some of the footnotes may be unnecessary, but someday they will be necessary. Um, because, and even today, I don't know that I even get all the current cultural references and uh, trying to assemble those and make those uh, um, yield up their underlying hidden meanings too. Because any author writing a book has pulled materials from the air, from other books, from all kinds of influences on their life and their thought. And what I'm trying to do when I annotate is to expose those things and, and sort of lay out for the reader what this means. Why is this here? What is this phrase? What is this name? What is this historical reference?